A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month is to be the first of all the others for you, the first month of your year. Speak to the whole community of Israel and say, on the 10th day of this month, each man must take an animal from the flock, one for each family, one animal for each household. If the household is too small to eat the animal, a man must join with his neighbor, the nearest to his house as the number of persons requires. You must take into account what each can eat in deciding the number for the animal. It must be an animal without blemish, a male one year old, you may take it from either sheep or goats. You must keep it till the 14th day of the month when the whole assembly of the community of Israel shall slaughter it between the two evenings. Some of the blood must then be taken and put on the doorposts and the lintel of the house where it is eaten. That night, the flesh is to be eaten roasted over the fire. It must be eaten with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. You shall eat it like this, with a girdle round your waist, sandals on your feet, a staff in your hand. You shall eat it hastily, it is a Passover in honour of the Lord. That night I will go through the land of Egypt and strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, man and beast alike, and I shall deal out punishment to all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood shall serve to mark the houses that you live in. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and you shall escape the destroying plague when I strike the land of Egypt. This day is to be a day of remembrance for you, and you must celebrate it as a feast in the Lord's honour. For all generations, you are to declare it a day of festival forever. The word of the Lord. The response to the psalm. The blessing cup that we bless is a communion with the blood of Christ. The blessing cup that we bless is a communion with the blood of Christ. How can I repay the Lord for his goodness to me? The cup of salvation I will raise. I will call on the Lord's name. The blessing cup that we bless is a communion with the blood of Christ. O oh, precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his faithful. Your servant, Lord, your servant am I. You have loosened my bonds. The blessing cup that we bless is a communion with the blood of Christ. A thanksgiving sacrifice I make. I will call on the Lord's name. My vows to the Lord I will fulfill before all his people. The blessing cup that we bless is a communion with the blood of Christ. A reading from the book of St. Paul to the Corinthians. This is what I received from the Lord and in turn passed on to you, that on the same night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and thanked God for it and broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this as a memorial of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Whenever you drink it, do this as a memorial of me. Until the Lord comes, therefore, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming his death. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise and honour to you, Lord Jesus. I give you a new commandment. Love one another just as I have loved you, says the Lord. Praise and honour to you, Lord Jesus. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. It was before the festival of the Passover and Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to pass from this world to the Father. He had always loved those who were, in his, were his in the world, but now he showed how perfect his love was. They were at supper and the devil had already put it into the mind of Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had put everything into his hands, 
and that he had come from God and was returning to God. And he got up from table, removed his outer garment, and taking a towel, wrapped it round his waist. He then poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel he was wearing. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, At the moment you do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. Never, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus replied, If I do not wash you, you can have nothing in common with me. Then, Lord, said Simon Peter, not only my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus said, No one who has taken a bath needs washing. He is clean all over. You too are clean, though not all of you are. He knew who was going to betray him. That was why he said, though not all of you are. When he had washed their feet and put on his clothes again, he went back to the table. Do you understand, he said, what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and rightly, so I am. If I then, the Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you should wash each other's feet. I have given you an example, so that you may copy what I have done to you. The Gospel of the Lord. I neglected to welcome those who might be watching us through the live streaming uh, today, so you're very welcome to join with us. And we did set up the live streaming in the hall, but I think we, we rather were conservative about uh, our space in here, so I think no one's actually in the hall, so otherwise I would welcome those people uh, watching the live streaming there. Uh, so uh, we begin our sacred triduum, um, and as we were saying at the start, it's, it, it, it's best to see it as all one event. Liturgically, that's the way it's put forward to us. Uh, it's all one account, uh, one, one commemoration, but spread over these different days. And it will give us, therefore, different, different moments, different, different aspects of uh, this sacred event of the sacrifice of Jesus for the sins of the world. Um, and and we're going we're gonna to learn different, uh, different things along the way, the more we can enter into this. Um, if we were looking for a key, really, to, to say, well, then, uh, what are we to understand fundamentally? Why, why has God given us this gift of Easter? And why this year? Uh, and and how, do we, uh, how do we experience something more? Not just in our minds, as it were, just to, to, to understand the narrative, but how do we experience this? How, do, how, does it, how does it become part of our lives? Because this is what Christianity offers us, not just, not just a hobby, uh, a way of life a meaning uh, at the center of life and a way to live. So how do we, through this commemoration of Easter, receive more of being able to understand and to experience and therefore to live uh, what we're going to be celebrating? Well, a key to, to, to unlock the whole thing, if we wanted to just start off in simple terms, we don't understand Easter unless we put the theme of love at the very, very center of it. It has to be about love. And that's already very helpful because it means we're going to go forward, we're going to be learning about love. And the more we enter into it, we're going to be experiencing that love in some way. And we're going to be t being taught about how God sees love and, and how important love is to God and how that plays out on the human stage. And specifically, of course, in the life of Jesus and also his death and resurrection. So love, I'm going to offer, is, is, is the key that's going to open up all these mysteries. But we're going to be seeing different expressions of that love in different ways. And tonight, if we look at uh, three themes that, that emerge for us on Maundy Thursday, each one has a different expression of love attached to it. Uh, unfortunately, we, we can't do the washing of the feet this year. It's one of the things that's been clipped and culled uh, due to the restrictions. Um, but that is the first key theme. We had a lovely opening hymn. I'm not sure if you heard that, the words of that, the washing of the feet, but of course, the gospel account. And this is a, a, a charitable love, if you like. This is Jesus showing uh, this fundamental Christian attitude of charity, so important to, to the, the, the church throughout the centuries that it's grown in this expression of charitable love. Secondly, we have the institution of the Eucharist. We had Paul's account of it there. 
this, this central act of worship for the Catholic faith. But there we are, on the eve of Jesus' death, he institutes the Eucharist. And this, can we simply can say, is a Eucharistic love. We'll explore a little bit about what a Eucharistic love uh, might be. Uh, and at the end, we also can't have the altar of repose. Normally, we would go into another area, usually in the hall, uh, and spend time watching with Christ as we commemorate his time in the garden after this Last Supper uh, and his offering to him, of himself to the Father. And, and this starts to anticipate the sacrificial love, the sense of sacrifice, what it costs Jesus, that battle with himself, a sacrificial love, which, of course, then will lead us more clearly into what, what kind of love is being revealed tomorrow as Jesus mounts the wood of the cross. So if we think of those three aspects of love and say, well, what, what does that have to do with your life and mine? So the first, the charitable love. Jesus does something very practical. It was part of Middle Eastern culture. That if someone came to your house or as an act of, 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 of deference, uh, but also kindness and hospitality in, in dusty worlds where people didn't have nice shoes and socks, uh, they just had sandals mostly. Uh, it was a very practical thing. And you're walking through streets that probably had donkeys and cows and other things walking up and down. So to wash someone's feet uh, was, was, was a lovely gesture of hospitality, but usually reserved for servants because getting down and washing someone's feet seems like a servile uh, action. Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, bending down to wash the feet uh, of his disciples would have shocked them as we see in Peter. But we don't see a servile action in what Jesus does there. He's instituting the dignity of service, the dignity of that kind of love. And he says, I want you to do this to each other. So love one another as I have loved you, he says elsewhere. Love people like this. Don't feel that this demeans your dignity to serve one another, to reach down into the depths of their life, to clean off the dirt, as it were, figuratively or practically. Uh, and this, you know, if we look at the history of the church, so many expressions of charitable love. Really, the hospital system as we know it today grew out of the religious orders. It grew out of that desire for people to, to minister to people in their physical needs. But so many other, the schooling systems, the education systems, uh, all the ways that uh, the church has modeled that kind of sacrificial, uh, charitable love. And, and, and we can say even closer to home, uh, a family doesn't really work unless there's a sense of, of service, of helping one another. If everyone's just out for themselves, that becomes atomized. Uh, and likewise, we extend that to the family of society, a society that is selfish and only self-focused uh, is not going to work. Uh, it's going to, in the end, uh, uh, its self-interest is going to conflict uh, and it's going to create uh, hostility or division or, or, or whatever. So what Christianity offers us is a charitable love and to see dignity in that charitable love even if it's not recognized, even if it's not uh, acclaimed by the world, even if it goes unnoticed, Jesus does this action um, in order to give a model to us. He also, as, we, as it were, in the, in the very theme of washing, is anticipating, we could say, the washing of baptism. Uh, and so the serving that God does of us to wash away the dirt of our sin. And that, of course, is going to play out more uh, as we understand the events of the next few days, why Jesus goes to the cross. So we have that theme as well, a spiritual washing, a spiritual call to be serving one another, to help us to be divested of sin and to live the lives uh, with the dignity that God desires for us. So that's the first theme, the charitable love that Jesus offers us. So the second then, so the Eucharistic love. So he takes bread, he takes wine, we're told, and this was part of the Passover meal. And we had the account of the Passover, the institution of the Passover, so the primary uh, uh, act of worship for the Israelites, their greatest feast, commemorating their liberation from Israel, uh, and this extraordinary supernatural phenomenon where um, God told them to, to take the blood of a lamb and put it on their doorframe, so that when he came to take the firstborn, I mean, it's all quite sort of uh, somber stuff, um, that they would be spared. So, and then in that, they were liberated from Israel. Uh, and that uh, Jesus takes, but he, he now develops it, he transforms it, he fulfills it, if you like. Because here we have not just a lamb of sacrifice, we have the lamb of God. And it's his blood 
that is going to be figuratively, as it were, put on our doorposts to protect us now, not from just physical death, but to open for us the way to eternal life. And, and so he takes that sacred meal, but he does something new. He takes the bread and the wine and he brings new words into that rite and he says, this is my blood. This is my body. And, and he tells the disciples, do this in commemoration of me. That Last Supper, of course, is, is at the heart of, of every Mass that we celebrate because this is exactly what we do. We, we, we commemorate, we read these words, uh, and the, the words are said again. And our Catholic faith has understood through the light of the Holy Spirit that, yes, Jesus was being literal. It, the bread and the wine become his body and blood. This is what we mean when we start to, to look into uh, what is Eucharistic love. God, the almighty creator of the universe who's sustaining us right now and has the whole of history at his fingertips, knows exactly what's going to happen, is in charge of everything, hides all his glory and becomes, to our eyes, bread and wine, something so basic. It's a supreme act of humility that Jesus would commit to placing himself into this bread and this wine, not just once, but to remain in every church. We have the tabernacle with the tabernacle lamp, the vigil light, telling us that the Blessed Sacrament is reserved there. And that's Jesus. That really is Jesus in there. And a lot of the times, and, and we, we struggle to sort of try and understand it through our personhood, but we, we need to. He's there on his own. He's committed himself to being a prisoner in every tabernacle until the end of time. Sometimes acknowledged, sometimes worshipped, sometimes ignored. But somehow he's imprisoned himself in every tabernacle as an act of love. Um, and this is what we're, we're trying to grasp by the concept of Eucharistic love. Jesus gives himself to us as food. He gives himself, and we could imagine lots of times uh, people would receive Holy Communion. Some might not even be aware of what they're doing. Some might do it sacrilegiously, as it were, when their lives are not in communion with the teaching of the church and they're, they're not really in a good place to be able to receive such a, a divine gift. A lot of the time, our, might, our mind might be on what, what, what we're having for lunch. And before we realize it, we've received communion and we've not really understood the importance of the moment. And Jesus knew all of that. He knew that would happen. He knew that also there would be moments when people would truly receive that gift and, and at least be trying to be aware of, of what I'm being given here. God is giving himself to me as food. He's becoming part of my body and blood, but almost more importantly, part of my soul, my spirit, to feed me with the love of heaven. Um, so a Eucharistic love at the heart of our Catholic worship, the central uh, uh, way that we honor uh, God, uh, and gather as the people of God but also as an example and again because he does it on the eve of his cross it anticipates his sacrifice so the bread and the wine are offered up as his body and blood will be offered up on the cross so every time we receive Holy Communion we're entering back into that mystery of Jesus' death and resurrection so it becomes part of us so it's a liberating from sin not like uh, the, the, the slavery uh, that, the Egypt, that the Israelites had in Egypt but the slavery of sin we're being liberated from by the Lamb of God. And so that Eucharistic love is going to teach us how to love, that love has this sacrificial element. If God is so good that he would give himself so humbly, uh, so wastefully to the world, be willing to be imprisoned for love, then somehow that gives us a model of how to love, how to live our Christian lives. And that element of sacrificial love then is going to become more clear when we follow Jesus into the garden. Because there, um, so this is after the supper, he goes to the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane, and uh, he really takes on, it seems, the full import of what he's going to have to go through the next day. Um, and he struggles with his human will, because he had a human will, as well as a divine will. It's a mystery of Jesus, God, and man. And in his human will, he says, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. Take it. I, you know, literally saying, I can't bear it but just in the next moment he says nevertheless your will be done not mine and if we remember back at the beginning of Lent we had those, those account, the account of those temptations in the desert it's like we've got a bookend here because he's being tempted again but we sympathize uh, but it is a temptation to, to say no to the father's will but knowing what would happen if he did 
And yet everything in his human life uh, revolts against what he will have to go through because it's essentially his, his physical destruction. But we might, without really the information to go on, but we might read into it, it's not just his humanity. Um, in a mystical sense, some sort of people throughout the church's tradition and, and various saints and, and mystics have seen that somehow in, in what was going on in the garden was that Jesus, also in his divinity, was perceiving every sin that there would ever be in the history of the world. Every sin. He became aware of it. He felt it. He saw it. Uh, we can't really understand how that would be. But he became so clearly aware of it that it, and we're told in the account that he, he, he sweated blood. That, that he was so di under such distress that out of the pores of his skin, uh, his blood started to pour. And, and he was under clearly extreme duress and, and showing somehow in his acknowledgement of, of the sheer damage that sin is doing to the world, that he was having to take this on and offer himself as a sacrifice. That this struggle, this, this pain, is already again anticipating what's going to happen the next day. But it leads us into that whole realm of sacrificial love. That Jesus is willing to go through that for us, for everyone, uh, to take that burden of sin, to take away uh, the death of sin, uh, to win for us a new birth, a new life, a new way, a way of love, a, w a life of meaning, a life of dignity and truth, uh, which he's going to open up for us by the resurrection. And so uh, these three components of this evening's celebration begin to launch us uh, onto what's going to be played out uh, tomorrow and as we go forward. Uh, and it's for us to consider uh, how we learn from Jesus about charitable love, what that means for us in our lives, how we learn about a Eucharistic love and that, the role of that in our faith, the place of the Mass, the way we live the Eucharist, when we leave Mass and we're sent out, how do we follow suit? Um, and the sacrificial love. What does that mean for us that Jesus gave himself for me, for you? Um, and how do we live that uh, in our lives? So we go forward with uh, uh, enriched and, and encouraged by uh, these truths of our faith. And let's pray to be able to uh, enter into the the depths and the beauty uh, of this most sacred time. Uh, we know we've been passing through a very challenging period uh, in the world, but somehow God reveals that through the cross, uh, he, he leads us to the resurrection. So uh, this is, in, in some profound, mysterious ways, uh, a moment of opportunity for us, for the world, that through this suffering, God could reveal his glory more. So let's pray for ourselves and for our world uh, at this time for great blessings from God through the mysteries of Easter.